Hey everyone, my name's Adam, and I'm going to be leading you through a lecture on rashes that are important for the Step 2 CK exam. Um, all the images obtained are from dermnetnz.org, unless otherwise stated. And a couple of caveats before we begin. Um, first, you know, this, this lecture is not going to be completely comprehensive. I tried to focus on the most high-yield uh, dermatologic topics and dermatologic conditions that you'll most likely see on your exams. And second, um, I tried to focus on uh, diagnoses where they give you a picture, you need to be able to recognize the picture, and then answer some sort of um, question about it, know some key aspect of that diagnosis. So um, I tried to focus on those sorts of dermatologic conditions, and therefore I exclude certain topics such as um, vasculitis, cellulitis, um, even acanthosis nigricans, because those in those sorts of questions, it won't just be purely recognize this and tell us something about it. They'll give you more clinical cue, uh, clues. Um, so this is just kind of pure dermatologic conditions. Um, so let's get started. So one of the most high yield questions, at least in my experience, is regards to um, you know cancers of the skin, and one they really like to hit on is melanoma. Um, so some risk factors for melanoma include uh, sun exposure, particularly if there's a history of blistering sunburn. So not just um, like cumulative sun exposure over a long period of time, but a history of blistering sunburns. And also if there's a family history or if it mentions uh, dysplastic nevus syndrome, that can be another uh, risk factor for melanoma. In terms of the presentation, there's two main um, systems for recognizing a melanoma. One is the ABCDE system where you look at the lesion, you say, is it asymmetric? Does it have an irregular border? Are there multiple colors? Is the diameter greater than six millimeters? And is it evolving? Um, the second system is um, something they call the ugly duckling sign, which is basically that, you know, when people have um, nevi or kind of benign proliferations of melanocytes, you would expect all of the nevi on a single person to look pretty similar. So if there's like one that sticks out, particularly it's very dark, it's much bigger than normal, um, it's very asymmetric, and it just really doesn't fit with the pattern of the other nevi that the person has, then you can, can, can invoke this ugly duckling sign to um, inform your suspicion for a melanoma. Um, and then in terms of management, which is, you know, all the questions I've seen on MBME in terms of melanoma have been, they give me a picture of melanoma exactly like this one, and they say, what would you do next? And you always do an excisional biopsy with narrow margins. Um, in real clinical practice, if it's like on the face, on the ear, or if it's very large, sometimes you'd um, you just you you'd just do a punch biopsy, and then you would do or a shave biopsy, and then you would do um, kind of more definitive treatment with some sort of surgery, such as most surgery. But um, on the MVM exam, it'll almost always be excisional biopsy with narrow margins. Um, and then, you know, what will happen is the pathologist looks at that, they see if it's clear or not, and they also tell you whether it's melanoma or not. Um, and that kind of informs your next steps. Um, so applying the ABCDE to, the, to, to this specific lesion, we can see that it's asymmetric, kind of the shape isn't circular or, you know, a, you know, a clear shape. The border is a bit irregular, especially over here. We can see we don't really know if it goes in right here or not. Um, there are multiple colors. This color is different from this color which is different from this color. Um, we can't tell the diameter and we can't tell it's evolving just based on the picture. Um, and then, you know, I just wanted to highlight the fact that the picture on the left is um, a superficial spreading melanoma, which is the most common type. But you can also get nodular melanomas, and these actually tend to have a worse prognosis um, because they have more vertical penetration into the skin. One key point they like to kind of hit on is comparing melanoma or seb seborrheic keratosis. Um, so seborrheic keratosis is something that's very common in older age patients. It has this greasy, stuck-on appearance, um, and the way that this is managed is primarily through observation or reassurance, sometimes through application of liquid nitrogen. Um, and kind of the two ways I see it tested are they'll put a picture up of a seborrheic keratosis, and on the MBA, MBME exams, they always give you the most classic image, so it'll look pretty much exactly like this, very different from the melanoma that we saw on the previous slide. And I'll ask, you know, what do you do next? And it would be observation or reassurance, basically seeing if you can distinguish between a seborrheic keratosis and a melanoma. The other testable concept is related to the lesser trilot sign, 
which is um, it's more of a historical um, like idea in, in clinical practice is not readily invoked just because a lot of older patients have um, seborrheic keratosis. So it's sometimes hard whether to, to tell whether this is a, an actual thing or not, but it's a very testable concept. And what it basically is, is if, if a patient on, in the question stem comes with a rapid increase in the number or size of uh, itchy seborrheic keratoses, often on the back, then it should make you think of a GI malignancy and doing further workup for a GI malignancy. Um, so that's just a testable concept um, to think about with seborrheic keratoses. Moving on to other forms of skin cancer that are high yield for the MBE exams, the two other major ones are basal cell carcinoma, or BCC, and squamous cell carcinoma, SCC. Um, risk factors for both of these include um, cumulative sun exposure. So often in a question, they won't tell you that the patient has a lot of sun exposure, but they'll say that they're a farmer, a landscaper, a construction worker, something where they're outside a lot um, and would be exposed to the sun a lot. And then specifically for squamous cell carcinoma, some other risk factors that um, sometimes appear in these questions include a patient with a chronic burn or chronic healing, uh, healing ulcer, um, a patient who is immunosuppressed, so HIV patients, organ transplant patients, um, and then kind of a random one is um, arsenic exposure actually leads to an increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma. Um, so the presentation for these are for basal cell carcinoma, again, MBMEs will always give you the most classic presentation. For this, it's always a pearly nodule with telangiectasias and a raised rolled border. So this image on the left provides us with a great example. We can see the perfect rolled borders um, at this, um, you know, it's kind of hard from, from this view to to appreciate the telangiectasias, but we can see that it's erythematous, it's kind of pearly with these rolled borders. Compare contrast this with a squamous cell carcinoma, which will often be more of a chronic, non-healing wound or ulcer. And we could see an example of that over here. Um, the history of this is this patient likely had it for, would have this ulcer for, for months or years and it just never quite healed. That should really tip you off that the patient may have a squamous cell carcinoma. In terms of management, similar to the melanoma, we often do an excisional biopsy with narrow margins, especially on the MBME exam. Um, and two, two sort of testable concepts or two kind of high yield concepts are in terms of the incidence of skin cancers. Um, so the most, the most likely or most common by far is BCCs, followed by SCC, followed by melanoma. And then the second high yield concept is that, um, you know, and they kind of highlighted in first aid, I really like this diagram, is that if they talk about someone who has um, like a skin lesion on their upper lip, they often think of it as a basal cell carcinoma. And if they have a, a lesion on their lower lip, it's more often to be a squamous cell carcinoma. People aren't quite sure for why this, this is the case, but this is something they really like to test. And you can either remember it by remembering this graphic with the B on top or the S and the S on the bottom. I often remember that it's just a BS fact. Um, so the B on top, the S on the bottom. Kind of in line with um, our talks on skin cancer is talks on actinic keratoses. Um, so some risk factors for these include cumulative sun exposure, similar to the to you know all of the skin cancers. And for this, what you'll have is actually dry, rough, scaly plaques um, or papules that, um, you know, often a question stem, it'll be something that's there. The patient picks it off and it grows back. They pick it off and it grows back. And, you know, it's not quite severe enough to prompt concern for an actual uh, like squamous cell carcinoma, um, but it's a precancerous lesion. Um, so these actinic keratoses are actually a risk factor for squamous cell carcinoma. A certain proportion of them will transform into squamous cell carcinoma over time. A small, a small proportion, but you know, enough to be clinically relevant. Um, these are managed through liquid nitrogen. And you know, if in clinical, in, in a question, it'll almost always be liquid nitrogen um, or cryotherapy. In clinical practice, sometimes these are biopsied just because it's, it can be harder to distinguish between actinic keratosis and squamous cell carcinoma. But like I've said, on the MBME exam, they always give you the most classic presentation. So for this, it'll be a dry, rough, scaly plaque that um, is picked off and grows back. And we can see a good example of this here and here. 
um, you'll see with um, your own patients that these often have more, they're more significant when you touch, like when you touch them, you can really feel that they're rough, but sometimes they're kind of hard to see. And it's just when you, when you touch it, you can tell that it's there. Um, another high yield uh, topic on the MBME exams are dermatophyte infections. So uh, for these, in, in these there are a variety of them. There's tinea uh, corporis, which is on the body, tinea capitis, which is in the hair, or on the scalp, tinea cruris in the groin, and et cetera, et cetera, tinea pedis. Um, so some risk factors for these on the MBME exam, it'll often be a high school or college athlete, particularly a wrestler or a gymnast, someone who's on, who shares these mats among uh, many athletes, these mats get sweaty and um, that can lead to transfer of um, these dermatophytes, kind of colloquially, we call it ringworm. Another common, uh, another common way that they like to talk about it is exposure to household animals like uh, you know, cats or dogs. And then specifically for tinea capitis, this is more often seen in African-American children. The presentation, at least for uh, tinea uh, corporis or tinea of the body, is it'll be annular, pruritic, erythematous, scaly plaque with central clearing and a raised outer edge. So we see a nice example of that down here. We see a lot of central clearing with a raised, a raised edge. Um, and a key idea for this is that, and something that they test on the MBME exam, is that patients with immunosuppression, such as diabetes, CKD, HIV, can often present with disseminated dermatophyte infections. So not just one, you know, not just one plaque, but many plaques. Um, and that's a, that's just kind of a uh, an overarching key concept for many of these skin conditions is that if you see a patient who has very disseminated disease with um, dermatophytes, with psoriasis, with molluscum contagiosum. It should really make you think, is there a reason this patient may be immunosuppressed? Should I work them up for HIV or some other form of immunosuppression? Um, and that's just an important key concept to always keep in the back of your mind. The management for this is often they can be treated effectively, effectively with topical antifungals, the azole drugs. Um, but there are two key, two key times when you need to treat the patient actually with um, oral antifungals, such as griseofulvin or terbinafine. One of these is tinea capitis. This is very high yield for the MBME exams. They'd love to go after that concept. And then also in patients with disseminated, disseminated tinea infections. But I'd really focus on the fact that patients with tinea capitis need to be treated with oral antifungal drugs. Topicals will not work. Um, and an example of tinea capitis is down in the lower right of the screen. Another high yield uh, derm condition to, to think about for your MBME exams is psoriasis. So some risk factors for psoriasis are, it often appears at sites of local skin trauma. This is called a Kobner phenomenon. This is seen in uh, multiple types of skin conditions. Also patients with some forms of immunosuppression as I talked about on the previous slide and patients with a history of autoimmune disease. So the presentation for psoriasis are well-defined salmon-colored plaques with silvery scale on extensor surfaces, so often on the, on the uh, knees or on the elbows, and you can also see that on the scalp. And importantly, some other uh, symptoms to look for in a patient with psoriasis include nail symptoms, so you'll see uh, pitting or onycholysis. You know, we can, we can see a pretty good example of pitting down here, and or arthritis syndrome. Uh, arthritis symptoms. We know that psoriatic arthritis, in addition to ankylosing spondylitis, IBD, and Rider syndrome, or reactive arthritis, are some of the eight, the um, kind of these inflammatory arthropathies that are associated with HLA B27 positivity. Um, in terms of management, so limited disease, where you just have a little bit of disease, you know, a few a few plaques here or there, you would treat with topical steroids, vitamin D analogs or topical retinoids. And then importantly, if someone has moderate or severe disease, which is defined as at least 5% of their body surface area having these plaques, or if a patient has psoriatic arthritis, we often treat them with biologic medications, um, which are like infusion medications, methotrexate, phototherapy, etc. So like this patient down here who has, you know, these perfectly uh, perfect examples of what um, you know psoriasis look like on our MBME exams. This patient seems like they have quite a bit of their body surface area 
um, impacted by the disease. So they would likely actually receive these biologics, methotrexate, or phototherapy. And one very high yield aspect of the management of patients with psoriasis that they should never, never, never be given oral or systemic steroids because that can induce a rebound phenomenon when those steroids are withdrawn. So if a patient has these, has these salmon colored plaques with silvery scales and or nail symptoms and or psoriatic arthritis, um, that should make you think of psoriasis and we know how you'd manage that. Another high yield derm condition that we see on the boards is herpes zoster. Um, so this is often seen in patients with older age or with immunosuppression. Um, you know, the presentation for this will be a painful vesicular rash in a dermatomal distribution. Um, so on the bottom left, we can see that this is, um, this looks to be one of the thoracic dermatomes, whereas um, in this patient on the right, we can see that this is one of the trigeminal uh, dermatomes. And a key patient, a, a key fact about herpes zoster is that patients often have pain before rash and if patients have herpes zoster ophthalmicus where it's um, you know impacting v2 v3 of the trigeminal dermatomes such as this patient on the bottom right it can actually lead to chronic eye damage and vision loss so this is a very important thing to recognize quickly and to, to begin treatment for quickly and to get our ophthalmology colleagues involved when um, and the management for this is um, IV acyclovir which is a common drug that we use for many herpes infections so importantly, this will always be in a dermatomal distribution, very rarely will cross midline, um, and it's just something to look out for. The next high yield uh, derm condition is atopic dermatitis. Um, so this is a very common thing, especially we see in kids and teenagers. So risk factors for these include personal or family history of atopy. So they'll often have coexisting conditions of allergic rhinitis or asthma, or a family history of allergic rhinitis, asthma, and the presentation for this will be a child who presents um, either acutely with inflamed erythematous patches or probably more commonly patient who presents chronically with like kinified pruritic patches often in the flexural region so um, we can kind of see this down here this patient's likely had this uh, itchy rash uh, in the antecubital fossa for quite a long time and when they scratch 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 for a long time it leaves this like kinified kind of thickened skin um, and a key, a, you know, a key concept for um, atopic dermatitis in particular is that, you know, the fact that it's one of these chronic skin conditions, you know, these these areas of um, kind of skin that's that's not completely normal are prone to developing secondary infections. Um, so if a patient who has a chronic history of atopic dermatitis presents with kind of a, acute exacerbation of their skin condition. It should make you consider certain types of secondary infections such as um, eczema herpeticum, uh, impetigo. You can even see like molluscum contagiosum on top of uh, areas uh, where there's atopic dermatitis. Um, so that's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. And the management for this would be uh, moisturizers and on MBME exams more often will be uh, intermittent topical steroids. Um, you know, in clinical practice, moisturizers are the most important thing. They often call atopic derm. Um, the itch that rashes that that someone starts itching in a spot a rash appears there it gets more itchy they continue to itch the rash gets bigger and it's just kind of this positive feedback system um, but on the boards it will often be uh, intermittent steroids like a triampsin alone similar to atopic derm is um, contact dermatitis um, so some etiologies contact dermatitis there'll be um, like poison oak or um, poison ivy, so they won't tell you that the patient had poison oak or poison ivy exposure, but they'll say that the patient's been hiking or camping, often nickel. So this, they'll say the patient's had a new belt or a new watch and then has a rash in the location of where those things um, are normally worn on the body. You can also see contact derm in response to topical medications, to detergents, or to irritants. Um, so for the irritants, which um, we have a good example of is this down here, that leads to like fissuring and um, you know, just kind of tender skin. This will often be seen in a patient who has like OCD and is just washing their hands over and over and over throughout the day, or in a patient who, you know, started a, jo a job that requires latex gloves, such as a medical assistant um, or something of that nature. The presentation for this uh, can be can be quite varied, but 
Often the patient will have um, erythema with some blisters or vesicles. Um, they can get scaling, they can get fissuring, and uh, they often have secondary excoriations um, you know, because these, these areas get itchy and they're, they're constantly um, scratching at it. Management for this is avoiding irritants or allergens and um, using topical steroids. Um, so for this, this uh, picture right here, this looks like it's on a patient's wrist. Likely the, the history would be that they, they had a new watch and then they developed this rash, so we know that's a contact derm. And then down in the bottom right, we can see more of a linear um, rash with some vesicles. That is kind of the classic presentation of poison oak or poison ivy where they kind of get scratched in one long streak along one of their extremities um, and develop a rash there. Now we're going to compare and contrast um, two of the most common uh, vascular proliferations that you'll see on the NBME exam, and these are cherry hemangiomas versus strawberry hemangiomas. So a cherry hemangioma is a small, benign capillary hemangioma that is seen in middle-aged adults and increases in frequency with age. We see an example of it down here. And we, you know, the boards like to compare and contrast that with strawberry hemangiomas, which are benign capillary hemangiomas that are seen in infancy that typically grow over the first year of life and then regress spontaneously by ages five to eight. So importantly, they'll often show you a picture of an of an infant um, and the patient's mother or father brought them in and are concerned because they have this uh, like vascular, you know, red rash that um, that is increasing in size. They're like eight months old. And the answer to those questions is always provide reassurance because um, these will regress spontaneously by age five to eight. So no treatment is needed. Um, in clinical practice, if these um, vascular proliferations get too large, sometimes we can apply like topical beta blockers or other um, medications. But at least on the MBME exams, the answer will almost always be provide reassurance. Um, these will regress spontaneously by age five to eight. And a mnemonic that I use to um, kind of keep cherry hemangioma versus strawberry hemangioma clear in my head is that, um, you know, if you had a baby, you could feed a baby strawberries, but you wouldn't feed a baby cherries because you'd be afraid they'd choke on the pit. So that's just a, a kind of a silly mnemonic that I use to remember the differences between these two. Another common uh, skin condition is uh, seborrheic dermatitis. So this can be seen in infants called cradle cap. Um, we see a good example of this uh, down here in the bottom left. And um, some, some risk factors for adult patients to have it. It can actually be a sign of systemic disease, and they found that it's associated with patients with Parkinson's disease, stroke, and other systemic conditions. Um, the presentation, um, at least for the adult, is that it'll be a greasy erythematous plaque with scale, and it'll often be in the T-zone of the face, so kind of in this area. Um, and extending, you know, kind of to the sides of the nose. The management for this is um, topical antifungals. Um, so, you know, sometimes they can give like selenium sulfide um, and uh, and or corticosteroids. The next germ condition I want to talk about is molluscum contagiosum, um, just because uh, this is high yield, especially for the pediatric questions, and because um, it has a very characteristic appearance. So molluscum contagiosum from risk factors, it's often seen in children. It sometimes can be seen in adults, and when it is, it's often associated with high-risk sexual behaviors. Uh, presentation, so it leads to clusters of these umbilicated papules um, where there's a central dimple. Uh, the management for this will often be observation. Sometimes in clinical practice, we use liquid nitrogen or other topical treatments, um, but most of the time we just observe them and they go away. Um, as I described uh, previously on the psoriasis slide, Widespread molluscum contagiosum is not normal, especially in adult, and should prompt testing for HIV or other causes of immunodeficiency. And just looking at the morphology, we can see that these round um, papules with you know, a central dimple in the middle. Classic for molluscum contagiosum. Next, I want to talk about erythema nodosum. So this is often seen uh, with systemic diseases, and it's important to have a working differential for erythema nodosum both on the MBME exams and when you're on the clinical wards. So some etiologies that we often consider in the setting of erythema nodosum include um, bacterial infections, particularly strep infections, sarcoidosis, uh, mycobacterial conditions such as tuberculosis, uh, IBD or inflammatory bowel disease, uh, Bichette's disease, 
and endemic fungal diseases such as histo or coxy. The presentation for this will be a patient who has a painful raised inflammatory plaque almost always on the anterior shins, especially on the MVME exams. And the management for this will be to treat the underlying etiology. Um, so for, in these images, we can see these raised uh, plaques that will be um, tender for the patient. So there's one, there's one, there's one. And one important thing is, um, you know, it's important to have a differential for the acutely erythematous leg. And if a patient has bilateral disease, that almost automatically rules out um, a cellulitis, especially on the MBME exams. If the patient has raised red lesions on both legs, you should really be thinking about an erythema nodosum. Next, we're going to talk about erythema chronica migrans, uh, just because this is kind of a buzzword a buzzwordy type um, question where you just kind of automatically recognize it and are able to provide an answer. So this is associated with Lyme, Lyme disease. This presentation will be a bullseye rash. And importantly, it often initially presents as a confluent erythematous uh, papular macule, such as we see down here. And then over time, it takes on this bullseye appearance. Um, and on the MBME exam, they'll almost always show you it with the bullseye appearance. Um, for management, so if a patient has early localized Lyme disease where they just have a rash and then nonspecific symptoms like myalgias, fatigue, those patients are treated with doxycycline. And uh, on the MBME exams, they also like you to know that if a patient is a child or if, or if you have a pregnant woman, you often treat them with amoxicillin or cefiroxime just because doxycycline has been associated with some, um, some problems with the development of teeth and bone. Um, in young children and in developing fetuses. If a patient has early disseminated or late disease, where they have multiple uh, of these erythema chronica migrans, they have neurologic symptoms like a Bell's palsy, they have arthritis, they have encephalitis, signs of more severe um, Lyme disease, then you would actually treat them with IV ceftriaxone. Next, we're going to talk about erythema multiforme. This can have um, you know, quite a... Uh, a very characteristic presentation and kind of a sudden acute presentation. It's one of the true uh, like dermatologic uh, emergencies that uh, dermatologists take care of. So some etiologies for this, and this is and and for this the etiologies is might be one of the most high yield portions at least for the MBME exams. They'd like you to know that it's associated with certain infections such as um, plasma infections. And uh, it can also be associated with certain drugs, such as sulfa drugs, beta-lactam drugs, phenytoin. The presentation for this uh, on the MBME exams is patients will have multiple types of lesions. That's why it's called erythema multiforme. But um, the one that's most associated with erythema multiforme, uh, or more specific for it, are these target lesions, where you have um, three concentric color zones. So you have a dusky center, with um, a pale middle ring and then a bright red outer ring. So this image down on the bottom left has some perfect examples of this, such as right here and right here. Um, importantly, erythema multiforme can lead to mucous membrane involvement. Um, so it's important to try not to confuse it with uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, on the NBME exam, they would very rarely give you erythema multiforme and SJS or TN as answer choices for a patient with this sort of presentation because they can be so similar. Um, but it's just important to think to, to kind of uh, group those two things in your mind as being um, similar and you know things that should always be on a differential for patients with you know widespread uh, widespread dermatologic disease with target lesions and with uh, mucous membrane involvement. The management for this would be you often treat uh, try try to treat the underlying etiology and plus minus systemic corticosteroids. So after that foreshadowing, we're going to talk about Stevens-Johnson syndrome or uh, toxic epidermal necrolysis, which are kind of on a, a spectrum of disease. So risk factors for these is almost always initiation of a new drug. That'll almost always be the uh, inciting factor. Some common drugs include antibiotics, anticonvulsants, allopurinol, NSAIDs. You can also sometimes see it after a mycoplasma infection or after vaccination. Presentation is quite similar to erythema multiforme. You'll have fever, you'll have boule, um, you know, and often it'll be these um, kind of flaccid boule, such as you, you can see in this patient um, who has, who likely had these large boule that ruptured. Um, and 
it'll also lead to mucous membrane involvement and sometimes can lead to target lesions. So, so even though target lesions are most associated with erythema multiforme, they can also be seen in SJS or TEM. Um, the definitions for these, SJS is um, the diagnosis that's rendered when less than 10% of the body surface area is affected. TEN, if greater than 30% of the body surface area is infected, and then SJST and overlap syndrome, if between 10 and 30% of the body surface area is affected. Um, the management for these patients will be, um, most importantly, stopping the causative agent. They'll often get IV fluid replacement, skin care, and systemic steroids. Um, the fluid replacement and the skin care is very important because they have these large bullae that rupture, and um, it leads to a sloughing off of the skin and that can lead both to dehydration and can act as an area for uh, secondary infections to occur. And that's one of the reasons why SJSTEN has one of the highest mortalities for pure dermatologic diseases. Um, and down on the bottom right, we can see an example of what mucosal involvement would, would look like. Another important uh, drug reaction to consider is um, DRESS syndrome or drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. So risk factors for these also new medications, kind of similar medications as with SGS or TEN, antibiotics, anticonvulsants, allopurinol. One um, kind of important aspect of the presentation of DRESS is that you'll often see these manifestations two to eight weeks after starting a new med, which is quite a long latency period. Um, and you know sometimes patients won't even remember that they started that new medication at that time because it was so long ago. Um, but these patients will develop a high fever Facial puffiness, this is a really important aspect for NBME exams. A diffuse morbilliform eruption, as we can see down in the bottom left. And they'll have signs of organ involvement. So they can present um, kind of with problems in the majority of organs throughout their body. They can have hepatitis, myocarditis, lymphadenopathy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they commonly have this eosinophilia. So the management for this, similar to SGSTN, stop the offending medication. These patients are started on systemic steroids. So bottom left, we see the morbilliform eruption that's commonly seen in DRESS, particularly on the MBME exams where they give you the most classic presentation. And in the bottom right, we can see an example of a patient with a puffy face, which is also included on MBME exams. Next, we're gonna talk about um, acne, which is a very common skin condition. Um, so risk factors for these, often seen in adolescents and more so seen in uh, men over women actually because um, it's at least partially related to androgens and men have higher androgen levels than women. Um, for presentation, it leads to a polymorphic uh, presentation. So, you know, it's not symmetric. It's just kind of like random. You'll see closed open comedones or whiteheads or blackheads as they're colloquially called along with inflammatory pustules or papules. Um, and in severe cases, we can see large or cystic nodules that can lead to scarring. On the MBME exam, probably the most high yield part is just knowing um, kind of the stepwise management of a patient with acne. Um, and for MBME purposes, the way that you should approach that is you'll start with um, some topical medications like topical retinoids, salicylic acid, benzoyl peroxide, some of these things you can get over the counter even. If that's not sufficient to control a patient's disease, then we'll move to topical antibiotics, often like a topical um, erythromycin. If that's not working, then we move to oral antibiotics. And if oral antibiotics aren't sufficient to control a patient's acne, that's when we kind of bring out the big guns and move to oral isotretinoin. There are um, two high yield associations with uh, oral isotretinoin, both related to the fact that it's a vitamin A derivative. First, um, as a vitamin A derivative, is associated with uh, significant birth defects, and therefore patients who are started on isotretinoin need to be placed on contraception, often two forms of contraception. And then because it's a vitamin A deficiency, it's associated with uh, pseudotumor cerebri or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, um, which will be, um, you know, a patient will have headaches, pulsatile tinnitus, um, and large blind spot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those are just two high yield associations to have with uh, oral isotretinoin, which is kind of our last ditch effort to help a patient with, um, with their acne. On the boards, you'll often need to compare contrast acne with rosacea. So in contrast to acne, which we often see in um, adolescents, rosacea, rosacea is much more common to see in middle-aged women and often in women with um, 
you know, fair skin or with significant sun exposure. Presentation for this will be flushing and erythema with telangiectasias, and they can also get papules and pustules, but importantly, they will not have comedones. They will not have whiteheads or blackheads. That's one of the key distinguishing features between um, rosacea and acne. And there are multiple subtypes of rosacea. The presentation that I'm most focusing on is the erythematotelangiectasia um, presentation because that's the most common one seen on MBME exams. But you can also have papulopustular rosacea, fimenous rosacea with irregular thickening of the nose, as we can see in this patient down on the bottom left, and even ocular rosacea. The management for this is um, avoiding triggers, so having patients avoid sun exposure, spicy foods, alcohol, and there are various topical um, medications we use, such as metronidazole or azelaic acid. For the MBME exams, though, the most important thing will be just distinguishing rosacea from acne in a, in a clinical stem. Next, we're going to talk about um, dermatitis herpetiformis. Um, so this is seen in patients with celiac disease. They won't specifically tell you the patient has celiac disease, but the patient will have this history of foul-smelling stools, fat malabsorption, often be a patient who's younger, potentially middle age. Um, and then they'll also have these skin findings. They'll have a symmetrical, acicular rash, most commonly on the MBME exams, affecting the buttocks, the elbows, or the shoulders. Um, so we can see down the bottom left, the rash affecting a patient's buttocks, and on the right, a, 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 a similar rash affecting the patient's um, knees. And we can see that in both of these um, examples that it's a symmetrical rash. It's hard to see um, clear vesicles here. It looks like most of the vesicles have broken open and kind of crusted over. Um, that's commonly actually how they'll show you also on the MBME exam, either you know, fluid-filled vesicles or an area where you can tell there were vesicles, but they ruptured over and led to um, overlying crust. And the management for this is just avoiding gluten. Just how you manage the celiac disease will also manage the dermatitis or pediformis. Next, I want to talk about lichen planus. Um, so this will be seen in patients with um, hepatitis C or in patients taking certain types of medications such as ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, hydrochlorothiazide, some, some antihypertensive medications primarily. The presentation for this can be remembered by um, kind of the five Ps. So it'll be pyritic, purple, polygonal, papules, and plaques. Um, so we can see this down here. This is uh, purple, polygonal, and it looks like a plaque. Um, just based on the size. And importantly, these, um, you know, one way that they try to, or one testable concept they enjoy on the MVM exams is that these um, papules and plaques will often have this uh, Wickham striae, which is just these, these kind of white lines overlying the, um, overlying the rash, which we can see in this middle uh, image. And they also like to, like to put that on, um, mucosal surfaces. So in this, we can see we're looking at the inside of a patient's uh, cheek. Here's the tongue. Here's the cheek. And we can see these kind of white, um, like reticulations or white lines. And that should really prompt you to think about um, lichen planus. They really enjoy this mucosal site involvement. And you'll see it a lot, especially on your ob gyn shelf, um, you know, with patients who have um, vulvar lichen planus. Um, so the management for this is topical high potency steroids. If it's a limited disease and with widespread disease, often systemic steroids or phototherapy. I mean, I just want to bring this uh, bring this point back to the uh, vulvar lichen planus. Often on the face and on mucosal sites, you try to avoid um, high potency steroids. But one of the uh, key um, times that that's not the case is in a patient with vulvar lichen planus where you use topical high potency steroids. Next, I want to compare uh, tinea versicolor and vitiligo. These are two common conditions that can lead to um, hypopigmentation. Um, so, you know, they're important to distinguish between these two on your MBME exams. So for tinea versicolor, it will often be seen in a patient who is in um, hot, hot or humid weather. So a patient who, you know, is, it's in the summer, they're at the beach and they notice these these lesions that uh, didn't tan normally like the other parts of their skin. It'll present with hypo or hyperpigmented lesions. Um, hypopigmented lesions more commonly on the MBME exam, often on the trunk. And these will often have uh, overlying fine scale and or pruritus. Um, this pruritus can be important, uh, an important distinguishing factor between tinea versicolor and vitiligo. 
This is managed with uh, topical selenium sulfide, terbinafine, or ketoconazole. And I just want to point out that although it's called tinea versicolor, um, we don't consider it as being in the same class of conditions as the other forms of tinea we talked about earlier, such as tinea corporis and tinea capitis. Um, it's just the way that we refer to it. So we, we like to compare this to vitiligo, which is will be seen in a patient with some sort of history of autoimmune disease. So we'll say that the patient has type 1 diabetes or Addison's disease, and they present with complete loss of pigment over one or multiple uh, skin patches. And for MBME exams, they'll almost always be on their hands. Um, these are treated with steroid creams and phototherapy, and unfortunately, uh, vitiligo can be very difficult to treat. So this is kind of an important distinction to keep in your mind when um, they have a patient who presents with um, kind of hypopigmented lesions. Next, I want to compare um, two important vascular lesions, often seen in immunosuppressed patients, which are Kaposi sarcoma versus bacillary angiomatosis. Um, so risk factors for both of these include immunosuppression, so a patient who has AIDS or an organ transplant patient. For Kaposi sarcoma, it's often seen in Eastern European men, at least on MBME exams. Um, for presentation, it would be a vascular lesion that not only involves the skin, but also can involve the GI tract and the respiratory tract. Um, and Kaposi sarcoma is caused by a virus, HHV-8. It most commonly involves the lower extremities or the face or mucosal surfaces, particularly on MBME exams. And if they you know, are feeling generous and they give you um, information about biopsy results, it'll lead to a lymphocytic infiltrate. And then an, another key distinguishing factor from Kaposi sarcoma and bacillary angiomatosis is Kaposi sarcoma, in addition to leading to a lymphocytic infiltrate, will often be associated with prominent lymphedema. This is an important uh, point that they like to make on the MBME exams. Uh, for bacillary angiomatosis, this is caused by Bartonella hens hensleyi, um, and it leads to red, firm, friable exophytic nodules. Um, so we can see a, a nice example of that down here in the bottom right. Um, if they were to give you biopsy results for this, it actually leads to a um, neutrophilic infiltrate. Um, so management for these diseases, um, so for Kaposi sarcoma, we'd like to give the patient um, their heart treatment for, you know, if they if they are an HIV or AIDS patient, and then we can, you know, often use localized treatment for specific lesions, such as this lesion down here we can see on a patient's foot. For bacillary angiomatosis, we often treat with erythromycin, which is targeted against the Bartonella hensleyi. Lastly, I wanted to compare and contrast pemphigus vulgaris and bolus pemphigoid. These are the two most common. Um, Derm conditions that lead to, that are kind of primarily lead to vesicles or boule that you'll see under MBME exams. Um, this is more of a concept that I think is tested on step one than step two, at least in my experience. Um, but it's something to kind of keep in your keep in the back of your mind nonetheless. Um, so first we'll talk about pemphigus vulgaris, which is the more severe um, of these two diagnoses. So this leads to flaccid boule or boule that kind of rupture open, as we can see in this patient in the bottom left. Um, and importantly, it leads to flaccid boule and mucosal involvement. This will more commonly be seen in a middle-aged uh, patient, sometimes an older patient, but more commonly a middle-aged patient. And this is caused by um, IgG antibodies against a component of desmosomes called desmoglein, and that leads to a cantholysis on H&E exam, or H&E stain. Now this is something they really like to, to get at at step one exam. Step two would most likely be just kind of distinguishing between these two and just knowing that Pemphigus vulgaris leads to flaccid boule, mucosal involvement, and a middle-aged patient. We can contrast this with bolus pemphigoid, which leads to tense boule, as we can see in the, in the image in the bottom right, that spares mucosal surfaces, is more commonly seen in older patients, and is due to um, antibodies against hemidesmosomes that um, kind of help link the, the cell to the basement membrane and it'll lead to um, a linear pattern at the epidermal dermal junction because of that. Um, so the kind of the three things to look at is the type of boule, flaccid versus tense, look if there's mucosal involvement or not, and then look at the demographics of the patient, whether they're middle-aged or older patients. Um, thank you for your time and attention, and I hope you have a great day.